Hey, you want to shut your opposition down? First, try buying them out. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto, and here's the deal. Auto companies are now all for hiking fuel efficiency standards. The same companies which aggressively fought this for decades, going along like meek puppies today. Trust me, these guys didn't suddenly find environmental religion. More like big government with a club. A government that has taken over two of the big three and has no problem keeping an eye on the other. So who in that group is going to break from that group? or that group think. Who among them these days would fight over fuel? Best to take a pass on the gas and let the White House do pretty much what it wants to do. No wonder why they were so quiet. It's because they are so beholden. Never mind settling tough fuel standards for an industry that can ill afford to do so right now isn't very easy. Saying no to the government that's got you by the throat certainly ain't any easier. I do see a pattern here. You buy out the banks and not a peep out of them when you want to regulate pay at the banks. You scoop up the insurers, not a dissenter, when you want to increase taxes on insurers. After all, you're bought and paid for, aren't you? Silence isn't only golden, it is, shall they say, strongly recommended. It is not the American way, it might be the Tony Soprano way. Don't wait around for your opponents, buy them out, then shut them down. After all, they're underwater, which I guess they think is better than simply being underground. And it's happening, and soon. The average American vehicle getting 35 miles per gallon on the road. But Carl Brower, who is the editor-in-chief over at Evans.com, says it won't be an easy road, or for that matter, a cheap one. So, Carl, um, where is this going? I mean, how doable is it when I heard the president say getting to 35 miles per gallon, we could take advantage of off-the-shelf technology? I've looked at the shelves in my garage. There's nothing on my shelves that can make this happen overnight. So what happens? <laughs> You don't have that 100 mile per gallon carburetor sitting in no, there, Neil? No, I've that's, looked that's, that's everywhere, Carl. I've looked everywhere. <laughs> that's too bad. Well, it's a very simple uh, proposition here. You pay more for less car and everything works great, okay? If, if you pay more for technology that's going to get you better mileage, you get a smaller car with lower power and less space inside of it, uh, inside of it and possibly less luxury features, and uh, you can get 35 miles per gallon. I think Americans will, will love the concept of paying more for less. But what if the, the wind is at the president's back and even those who are, are pushing this environmental um, mission? Um, I, I don't know where oil prices are going, but a lot of the experts say they're going higher because it's a finite supply. The global economy is going to pick up. Um, I know the president bakes into this environmental cake $3.50 a gallon gas by 2016. That seems fairly doable to me at, at, a, at the least. So... Maybe he's not so crazy. What, what do you make of it? Well, there's some upsides to this for sure. The, the standardization of the fuel mileage requirements uh, cleans up a big mess that was causing a lot of the manufacturers a headache. So I think that's one of the things that they genuinely are, are happy about and pleased with. Uh, and I think it's good that, that we're going to see a standardization that they can all work toward. But um, the bottom line is, Americans have always shown a passion for cars with plenty of power and lots of space, increasingly more space in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and they're not going to be able to get that. That will not be available to them if uh, the average has to be 35.5 miles per gallon in seven years. Well, what if, um, what if things are so, so depressing for us just affording these cars that we can't afford to eat, we lose weight anyway, and eventually do fit in them? <laughs> well, what I'm thinking is going to happen is a lot of people are going to be keeping older cars. You know, I'm telling people right now, if you've got a powerful, uh, roomy car, hang on to it. It's, it's an endangered species as is of it, today. Is it really? Because I know, Carl, you know, uh, I'm a little older than you, but I do remember when we had the 70s gas scare and everyone was going to be riding around in these, you know, uh, Ford Pintos and everything else that were the, about the size of, of my kid's Matchbox car. And, and all of a sudden... <laughs> This, this destiny of the world uh, proved to be short-lived. We were back in the big cars. Then these SUVs came along, and uh, everything went back to the future, which went back to the past. You know? Well, it wasn't short-lived, though, Neil. I mean, that all started in about 72, 73, as you say. And in my opinion, the dark ages of the American automobile industry, at least the last one, was about 14 years. It took about to the late 80s before things like decent power and uh, capable uh, luxury cars came back. It was a pretty, it was a pretty but dry But can you have both, Carl? You know cars far better than I ever will. But um, 
Can you have both? I mean, I remember the first SUVs when, when American Motors was selling them, they were really lousy on gas. I think they got like three or four feet a gallon. And, you know, they're not, you know, barn burning success stories now when it comes to fuel efficiency, but they're a heck of a lot better than they were. So just by osmosis does, does this happen, you know what I mean? Where you can have your big vehicle and you can have relatively good fuel efficiency. You can have whatever you want, Neil. It costs money. That's the trick. Uh, so I think whatever this we're getting, the that... vehicle itself is going to cost a lot more. Exactly. You want a powerful and fuel efficient large vehicle? Absolutely available. Are you going to get it for, you know, mid high 20s like you can now, even low 20s depending on the model you're after? Maybe not. Maybe you're going to add, you know, the government's saying $1300. I think that's a bit optimistic. Uh, and again, if they well, have to start shrinking the size. When you say it's a bit optimistic, size, what do you think it really is? Well, I think to get an equivalent sized vehicle with the same power, but the mileage that they're asking for, I think that's going to be thousands and thousands of dollars. Wow. I think what you're going to see is vehicles shrinking in size and shrinking potentially in, in uh, horsepower and mm -hmm. then uh, and still an increase in, in cost. And then you might get where they want us to be. No, well, that's not good, Carl. The cars are getting smaller. I'm getting bigger. That's not a good combination. <laughs> Carl, thank you very much. Very good having you. Thank you. All right, well, fair and balanced now, my next case.